Hey everybody, this is Dr. Maples. Let's pick up on our theory lecture. That's right, we're talking about theory in a research methods class. There's a good reason, because research methods includes theory as part of how we try to make sense of this awesome shared society that you and I experience and that Auguste Comte charged us with following all and studying all those years ago. Now, let's continue to break down this theory idea. You've heard in my intro classes, in other people's intro classes, in some of your other classes in general in sociology, you've been hearing about three paradigms or lenses. I use the phrase lens, other people use paradigm, same idea. You've been hearing about these your entire sociological life. In fact, you've probably heard the phrase structural functionalism, symbolic interaction, and conflict perspective many, many times. And they may even have been prevent, presented as sort of like a theoretical idea. Well, I guess I have a really important, possibly bit of sad news. When we present these ideas in early classes, we try to keep them simple. And sometimes we say that they're theoretical perspectives or paradigms, and we don't really explore what that means. These ideas are not, are you ready for this? They are not theories. Theories are very specific things. These are like ways of thinking about creating a basket that you could hold lots of different theories in. So for example, the structural functionalism lens could hold a lot of the theories that I've used to study immigration uh, when I was a PhD student. Likewise, the symbolic interaction lens could hold a whole bunch of theories about individual interactions, kind of like the looking glass self, or um, the many themes that they have, or many different theories that they have that fall in that category. Um, likewise, with the conflict perspective, we could think a lot of Marx falling into this work, and so a lot of his theoretical ideas could, could go into there. That's kind of what they are. They're kind of like baskets. They hold these theories and they're all very similar and we can always use these perspectives in our work to try and understand what's going on. But they aren't necessarily theories. They're baskets of theories. The cool thing is, is you can still put these into effect in your papers, but you're never going to say uh, structural functionalism theory because it's not a theory. It's actually sort of a perspective. It's a way of seeing things. In fact, for sociologists, it's a way of saying, hey, this is kind of the way that I'm approaching this. Now, within that, you could then go down to a more specific theory that you might be trying to apply. So, for example, uh, let me use structural functionalism and ethnic niches. Um, ethnic niches are the idea that immigrant workers are overconcentrated in particular industries for very specific reasons. It has everything to do with how they experience the labor market, the kind of job opportunities that are available to them, um, the kind of job opportunities, too, that as immigrants who may not speak the language where they live that are available to them, and also a whole bunch of other things that shape that. We could do a whole lecture on ethnic niches. That was my dissertation topic, but I'm going to say you all that information. Instead, you can just read my dissertation like six other people on this planet have and learn all about that yourself. Now with ethnic niches, it's definitely the story of how groups are experiencing structures in our society. And that falls into a structural functionalism category because with structural functionalism, we'd be thinking about how all these different systems in our society interact. Well, we can kind of see how for immigrants, that it would explain how they interact. It also gives us a good chance of a meso theory, which we talked about in our previous lecture, because we're talking about how groups interact. Do you see how that works? We're not using a structural functionalism theory because it's like a basket or a lens or a paradigm or a perspective, whatever word that you'd like to use. But we're using a specific theory that would fall in that category. There's also, I have exciting news to tell you, and you'll probably get to see some of these in Dr. Pellucci's classes, uh, additional paradigms that you may not have heard about, things like positivism, social constructionism, postmodernism, and more. Now, these are all, again, baskets that hold lots of different theories. So keep that in mind when you're writing your thesis. You can use these as a starting point, but then you're going to go down to more specific theories. Let's move on. Let's try to see what else we can do to break this big idea of theory down into smaller pieces. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that we use theories in different ways in our paper. We can think about how theories could be inductive or deductive. And this is an important difference that I want you to take a moment and try to focus on how you might think about a research topic based on where the theory falls. So inductive is the most common one. 
And frankly, it ends up being usually about 95% of the theses that are written for our major. Um, it's the easiest too, if, or easier if you're looking for which one's usually the easier one. It's inductive. What happens is that you read a whole bunch of literature out there on the topic that interests you, you collect data on that topic, and then you analyze it to test hypotheses. And then what you do is you put the theories into practice to try and explain the patterns that you find in your data. That's the most common approach. Now, deductive is a little different. Deductive, you actually start out with theories. You use the theories to guide what data you might collect. You use it to guide what you're seeing in those, um, in the data. So it's exciting that in a way you get to choose where theory is gonna fall into your paper based on how you want to approach it. That said, I'm going to tell you 95% of students use inductive approaches, 95% of graduate students where they're working on their master's or PhD use deductive. In fact, that's what I did. I started with a theory that shaped the data that I analyzed and that shaped even how I understood my findings. Inductive is going to be the far more common one for you. Now, we're going to continue to break some of those ideas out because I want to explain some different examples. Let's use um, two projects that I've worked on, um, and then we'll use a third one that kind of overlaps to show how these two can blend together sometimes. But in the pure sense, um, let's talk about an inductive paper that I did. So uh, when I was a graduate student, I studied uh, cemeteries in West Virginia, and I tried to understand why these cemeteries were being allowed to fall into disrepair. Uh, so I went out and I read a whole bunch of literature about how we understand cemeteries and how that's changed with time. I tried to understand uh, how and why people would take care of cemeteries. And then with time, I went out and collected data on specific cemeteries that were falling into disarray they, because they were near mountaintop removals. Uh, they were isolated from the communities. They were you know, people leaving from the area. So there might only be like one or two really elderly people there and they couldn't take care of the cemetery. So what I ended up doing is collecting all my data, collecting all my ideas, setting up my hypotheses first. And then when I got to the end of it, I started seeing this really common theme of the breakdown of the community near these cemeteries. People were leaving, people had looser ties to the community. Uh, the people that were there weren't really able to interact with the community anymore. This is where I then found the theory of place attachment which would be a structural functionalist, or it could be used as a critical theory, depending on its application, to try to understand how groups of people um, experienced um, greater or lesser attachment to a particular place. Um, I used this theory to interpret what my results meant at the very end. I pointed out that these communities that had these lower populations um, or even shrinking or non-existent populations, they generally had weaker place attachment and therefore they should typically have the cemeteries that were the weakest uh, or having the most uh, problems. And it held true. In fact, that paper was published in the Journal of Appalachian studies. It was a really exciting paper and a great example of using inductive um, theory to just start out by collecting your data and your ideas and then end it with theory. Now with the book that I'm just now, uh, I finished up, it's going to be published uh, in the fall of 2021, um, I used a deductive approach. There I started with the idea in my literature review of something called the sacrifice zone theory. And this is the idea that certain parts of a region are set aside for waste, poverty, loss. I argued that that applied to the development of Eastern Kentucky. I went through the history of the region and pointed out all these different instances and ways in which parts of Eastern Kentucky were set up to basically be sacrificed zones. They were going to be lost for the greater good of other areas, almost always not in the state of Kentucky. What I then did is used this idea to guide the cases that I would look for. And so I started with my theory and then that helped me understand what data that I should collect. In fact, I started to go through Kentucky history and find all these really cool cases where things didn't make sense otherwise that these areas were being set aside to be lost, like radioactive dumps in Estill County. And it didn't make sense if I had collected the data first, but by starting with a theoretical perspective, it kind of helped me understand what I was looking at when I found those cases. Likewise, the Red River Dam, which was not followed through on twice, um, was another good example of that, where it was very much a sacrifice zone, uh, where the area had been set up to be lost. 
do you see as a PhD, I started with theory there and then I ended up with data collection and then ended up with my analysis? That's deductive. Now inductive, again, we start with the idea of uh, collecting our data, the ideas that other people have, but then we move to theory to make sense of it. It's a subtle, careful difference, but getting that right will make your life a lot easier. Now, we're going to leave that there. Oh, actually, no, we're not. We're going to throw in one more slide. Sorry. With this last part, I kind of want to point out, too, that my book, in a way, actually did a little bit of inductive stuff as well as deductive. So my book used theories like uneven development um, and sacrifice zone to deductively understand the region. Um, but I also, in collecting the history and data and things like that, I did some inductive stuff where I collected economic expenditure data and then, in the end, used theory to explain it. I only point this out because these categories aren't always perfectly split in half. That said, I go back to what I said earlier. 95% of you, if not 100% of you, are going to go with an inductive approach. You're going to read literature that's out there. You're going to collect data. You're going to formulate your hypotheses and then collect data. And then in the end, in your uh, discussion section, is where you're going to be focusing on theory. That said, we won't be doing any of those things this semester. If at most, we might pick a theory, but we won't be doing a lot of application and applying it. So don't be freaked out because theory is not going to be a super important part of the methods class. In fact, it'll pop up far more in the 470 class, and we'll talk about it again there so you feel comfortable with it. Now that is where I'm going to end this lecture. If you have questions, if you have concerns, you know where to find me. Don't freak out about any of this. Again, theories are just big ideas, and we're going to learn how they can work into making our research better, but they can't harm you. If you got any questions, you know where to find me. We'll talk soon. See ya.